started, as Stacy said, as an educator, so I, I hope that I have that perspective of educating the child as far as the whole K-12 system. I really keep that in mind when I think about <coughs> excuse me, what's happening and what we're doing with technology. As Stacy said, I was in a really unique situation a couple years ago. I made the big leap from a principal shift to get back into higher ed. And I also was fortunate at that time to work with Scott McLeod. Some of you, I know, came up before and talked about some things that Scott's done. Scott really coined the term school technology leadership. So in other words, uh, our group at Castle really was the forefront of looking at the impact of school leaders and how school leaders can leverage technology for change in schools. And I might say that a lot today. And that's really our push is how can you leverage technology for change in schools? Because <clears throat> one thing I'll talk about a bit is we've seen schools and we've seen schools that went one to one and didn't have a lot of success with it. We've schools, seen schools that have had challenges with it. We've also seen very successful challenges. And what we know may be obvious to many people in this room, and that is simply putting a device in the hands of a student or an adult for that matter, doesn't necessarily change the game right away just by putting that device in a child's hand. So we're going to talk a bit about why one to one. So why this big shift in one to one? Why are schools making this investment of time, this investment of resources to move to one to one? And I'm going to frame this through sort of this big picture conversation. I'm going to get you started right away in some conversations at your table and thinking about the impact technology has had on other sectors. So we're going to move through some sectors really quickly here, but I want you to think about this. And you're going to see this sort of starter for a couple of different industries. What impact have the internet and other technologies had on television, movies, music, uh, and video? So talk to your table. I'm going to give just about a minute. And think about that conversation piece. What impact have both the internet and other technologies had on these sectors? So talk to your tables for about a minute about the impact of those two things. <laughs> I'm still waiting, I'm still waiting for the toilet. Is that the laptop? Yeah. <laughs> thousands of you know, songs, videos as well, um, when you travel, kids, it's harder to get away from it. You've got to make a more conscious point to actually break. And 
and there's been also as a result a profound impact on the workplace, but also the ability to control is there, um, including uh, being able to edit out commercial breaks. So more insidious ways of putting advertising in the development. <laughs> yeah, you, you talked about a couple of big things there. You talked about choice, <laughs> you talked about access and also control of the technology. So this has really impacted these industries in a major, major way. If you think about music, some of you may be aware, the music industry initially thought the way to solve this was to sue their customers who were stealing this music online. Then there's sort of been a new model that's reinvented. Now we no longer have to buy a CD with 12 awful songs on it that one that we really want to hear. But we have a bit more choice in what we do with the media. So it's really shifted the way that a lot of these industries actually do business. Talk about this one at your table. I'm going to move you through these pretty quick. So talk about this one at your table as well. Have the same conversation. I'm going to come swim to this table. No, 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 no,
maps, car, airline travel, uh, travel agencies. Um, this is, again, a massive impact. In a, in a lot of ways, most of us have become travel agents of some sort yes. of our own. Yes. How about this one? Talk to you too about this. This is a really interesting one. Well, I'm just, 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 I'
concerns that you talk about as technology is rolled into schools. <coughs> changes the dynamics of, of the sort of the relationship between two individuals. Although they're doing a lot um, to make sure that you're able to stay in touch with your professor. So I'm taking um, two online classes right now, and I talk to my professors about five times a week. And, um, and when we're in class, I see everyone in my class and have far more of a face-to-face interaction with them than I think if we were even in our room. Because we see each other and talk to each other and we can decide that
using the technology, using social media, and trying to have a positive digital footprint with their students. We could have spent all day talking about this, and we still can. I have my uh, information is on the back of my of that packet as well. So if you want to email me as far as resources, can you please excuse the interruption? Can you please keep the students in block one until five minutes to ten? The break will be from five minutes to ten until five minutes after ten. The assembly will begin at ten o five. Thank you. So on the back of it, there are my email. I believe is on there. Yes. Yes. So feel free to shoot me an email. I have some resources that I can share with you as well. Um, if you have questions about a specific topic, I'd be happy to share with you, um, connect you with other people in the sort of that have went through this and, and found some of the challenges and have seen some of the successes because there are certainly challenges that exist as well as lots of positives that I can hope for your school. So with that, I think time-wise, Stacy. Yeah, I know we intended to have a little bit more time for questions and I see the hands, but we're gonna do one, one of the reasons Barb kept the kids five minutes is for those of you who would like to extend the conversation, ask uh, Nick a question, we can move over into the middle school conference room. I would really like to thank you for coming um, and asking great questions and having our time was about the varied response to technology among teachers. Some teachers, younger teachers, perhaps simply by virtue of exposure, being more willing and comfortable to um, integrate technology into the classroom versus teachers who have been <coughs> teaching for 40 years and are um, perhaps less uh, comfortable. And how does, how does a school fix that or, or bridge that, bridge that gap? I talked a bit with your administrative team yesterday, that was part of the conversation. And this might actually not be unique to technology. So in schools, we often have what we describe as pockets of greatness or you know, pockets of implementation, whether it be around reading initiatives or writing initiatives or technology initiatives, where the question for school leaders that falls on us is how do we ensure that we have equitable resources and equitable teaching across the board? That is a fantastic question. I don't have an easy answer to that, but we are certainly having conversations about it. I think it's a great point. Yeah. One other interesting question that came up was, because technology is becoming so prevalent in the classroom, it, will teachers, who is attracted to teaching, will teachers, will the people who are attracted to teaching be different? Um, simply because it is becoming more of a, techno, you know, a technological job. That, that, that knowledge and expertise in technology will influence, or the need for that will influence who's attracted to the job. So, so this is interesting, and I, and I will throw this out as a U.S. statistic. We looked at U.S. Department of Commerce, looked at 50, 55 industry sectors. Education was ranked dead last in Kentucky behind coal mining on the level on the level of technology intensiveness of the profession. So my response would that that would be when you look at other industry sectors like the IT world, any sort of marketing, any sort of graphic design, we're still got a ways to go. So, Kevin's over here? Yeah. Dr. Yeah. Um, I think our table was consumed with the um, iPads. Um, and I'll tell you my personal experience. Um, I have an eighth grader with an iPad now. And she was a child who used to uh, come home listening to the iTouch music on the bus. And now she's got her face to the screen for a 45 minute bus to She comes home to do her homework. She used to be on a desktop with a certain distance and a certain posture. Now she's slumped over a couch because we don't want her in bed. Uh, and she would prefer to do her homework in bed. But we have one room where we do homework, and so she's slumped over that couch in a very awkward position. She's developed a hunch. It's not even been four or five months. She is constantly complaining about eye strain and headaches because she will not do her homework on the desktop. And I keep telling her, maybe because of this gadget, why don't you do it on the desktop? All the apps I need to work on are on the iPad. So I cannot do my homework on anything but the iPad. From her body language, from the way she needs privacy suddenly to do her homework, it is very clear that all of the time she's not doing homework. Every time there is a post, <laughs> every time there's a Facebook post, she stops everything to go check what this friend has said. 30 seconds later, another friend has commented. 30 seconds later, later, another friend has commented. And her entire homework process has become so distracted, which on a desktop was a whole different experience. I used to tell her, you can do as much Facebook as you want, but first you have Facebook time. Do what you need to do. 
one is keep one to one in the school. Don't send it home because you put the monkey on our back. <laughs> it's just that there is, there was, you know, it's everything old fashioned is not necessarily negative. There used to be a generation that was not allowed to breastfeed their children because they were told, ah, oh, breastfeeding is bad for your kids. Put this formula into your children. And an entire generation of kids grew up without the immunity building thing that they would have gotten because the, the scientists thought this was the best thing since sliced bread. And I just feel like with technology for children, we have reached an extreme now where it is everything old fashioned was bad. Taking notes they no longer do, reading in the old fashioned way, studying in the old fashioned way they no longer do. And it's okay with an eighth grader, she has the maturity. I have a fifth grader going into middle school next year, he does not have the maturity to not get absolutely distracted all the time. And I'm very seriously concerned about this. And I know so many parents who are concerned about it and I just feel like we're not getting both. So you tell me, what is the solution? <laughs> situations, different students. We'll, we'll talk more about this as we move down, as we move through the presentation. But the other piece that I think we really have to be cognizant of is this technology is not going away. This is going to be a major part of our students' lives as they leave your home, as they move out. And what we've done historically is we've expected our students to leave the K-12 setting, to leave that atmosphere into a many times a university, a little, many times a much more independent place. And we haven't coached them about how do you multitask or when do you not multitask? What is appropriate to do online? What is the appropriate way to work, like slouched over, lay on a couch? And we haven't done that. And then we wonder why some of our students, some of our students at higher ed as they move away from school, why they have some of the issues that they have. Because we haven't done a good job coaching them and, and really working with them on some of the concerns that you address. I'll come back to some of these concerns as we move through, but just because of time, we're going to keep moving here, and I want to talk more about one to one. The other piece that you mentioned around keeping them at school, almost across the board, the, the research has indicated that for one to one, you be more successful if you get with the school, that technology becomes more personalized to the students. The students do take it home with them, it doesn't stop at the school. So a terminology used around one to one is often anywhere anytime learning. And this is a big, big positive, is that students can investigate not just the boring stuff that Stacy's teaching in her course, but they can find a topic that's really valuable to them that might be a future career for them. So that, again, anywhere, anytime learning is terminology often used around one-to-one. -one. And that's looking at the value that technology can add once it leaves the school. Um, I'm going to come back and talk about a word of usage, the way it's used is something that I want to talk about later. But before I do that, I'm just going to move through this. I'm going to move really quickly when we look at the wave that technology's had on our schools and thinking about why we've made a shift. Maybe one point? Yeah. And, and, and I don't want to belabor it, okay? but in the same way that we don't let students go out on the field without protective gear, we shouldn't be deploying technology and asking for any management tool or protective gear on them. Okay? You want for technology to be pervasive, that's fine. I'd like to report at the end of the week of how much time my child spent on a gaming site, how much he spent on a porn site, how much he spent on this. And then you have the information from parents. So the, the challenge right now is, is not just that one-on-one. One-on-one is, is you know, critical. All of our kids need to know technology. What we're not doing is we're not giving teachers or parents the tools that they need to help it be successful, to help their child learn how to use it effectively, to help them learn their discipline. So 
conversations. I, I believe that work is either in progress or the plans as far as, especially on the student side, but I also think there are parent things that have been, will continue to be offered at each building. I'm looking around the room a little bit and I'm seeing some of that shaking that I think that will be a big piece of it as well, the parent education, but also the student education here in school. And it needs to be more than just a course, which a lot of schools are doing, like unconditional citizenship. It needs to be something that's integrated throughout the curriculum and moves everywhere in the curriculum. So when we think about this shift, again, I said I, I look at this sort of like a, a five-act play. So why have schools made this transition? And you know, a big piece is our schools have changed. I mean, this is something we don't have to discuss. Students were given the choice, they'd much rather have their cell phone devices, and this isn't new, this is actually a couple of years old. When we look at US, UK students, they'd much rather pick their mobile device. A lot of us have actually thrown these in our thrown away because now our cell phones do the same purpose, same with our cameras. Our, our tools have drastically changed. The tools that we use in schools, almost any profession, our tools have changed. The tools have also changed how we connect, whether it's good or a bad, this is what's here. In a way, this is almost Facebook training for little kids. These little things like Club Penguin, WebKids, things like this. Our tools have changed drastically. Computing that one. People, machines, <laughs> is about people, not machines. This is a big piece too. One to one doesn't change schools necessarily until it follows with teaching and learning, a real focus on the things that are happening with teaching and learning. The other big piece is around information. The information that our students have and access to has changed drastically. So the question a lot of people have is concerns about the information our students find online is a serious concern. They say, Nick, our students are out there, they find something on a report, they just publish anything that they can find. And they're not critical consumers of information. Extremely, extremely valid point. But I would add this to it. We haven't done a good job ourselves of being critical consumers of information. We generally grab this textbook that was written by a group of elite people somewhere that decided what was important that put in our textbook. There are lots and lots of mistakes in those things as well. So a job for us is to talk to students about how do you become critical consumers of information? What's the difference in a domain that's not GOV, so produced by our government, or .edu, an education site, versus one that Nick Sowers puts out, or one that ends in .xxx, one of those. So, Educating kids about being critical consumers of data is an extremely, extremely important job that we have if we want to go out there and be successful citizens in our society. We're looking at a massive, massive shift in the way that information is handled, and maybe one that hasn't happened since the printing press. So prior to the printing press, we had scholars amongst this group of wealthy people that had access to data. Very, very, very few people could read and write. Printing press, flow information to the masses was a game changer. We're looking at an information age, so that's different. And it adds this piece where not only do we have access to information, but where everyone can be a publisher. Whether it's good or bad, <coughs> this is the world we live in, that everyone can be a publisher today. Everyone can put data out there. Everyone can develop an audience. Web 2.0, people now throw around Web 3.0 and different terminology, but we're talking about an audience. Um, the community is as well. So maybe not a popular person now, but 2006, he saw this shift happening in 2006 in the way that technology was impacting what's happening in our world. And look how power was shifting away from the media elite, which he certainly was the head of the media elite last day. And again, when we think about information, if it's, we're just looking at it as a place to look up information, there's a lot more out there with ways to connect, communicate, collaborate with one another. Another big piece of this, this whole shift is around our jobs and whether our jobs have trained, changed, this is a couple years old, but it looked at the change in importance of tasks for the U.S. economy. It would be similar in most developed countries. So I'm going to have some, I'll share this, this slide deck with everyone if they'd like it. 
Um, Tony Wagner talks about the seven survival skills in a book, The Global Achievement Gap. And he does a nice job. He looks at and goes to different business leaders and says, you know, what are our students not coming out ready with? What things don't they have? And he talked a lot about things like this, global awareness, problem solving, creativity, analytical skill, skills, these sort of things. These pieces are a big piece a lot of schools have shifted to one wall. <laughs> Richard Florida talks about the nature of work and how it sort of shifted. And he looks at, again, he sort of divides it into four classes. That creative <coughs> class would be things, and that's one that's drastically going up. This is outdated. The, 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 the increase has steadily grown up as well up until today. Um, and you can see that would be jobs like teachers, scientists, those jobs that aren't routine type jobs. <coughs> so Daniel Pink asked these questions. We think about the future of the jobs we want to prepare our students for. Question one, can someone else do it cheaper elsewhere? Question two, can a computer do it faster? If your answer to those questions is yes, probably not a job opportunity for our students. And the third thing that he looked at is what I'm offering or the skills that I bring to the table. Are they valuable in an age of abundance? We have a wealth of information, we have a wealth of resources, ways to connect. And this is a dilemma. Our schools haven't changed. In a way, schools were designed for this system. Schools were designed for this graph on the left. When we have this was the sector of jobs that we expected our students to go out and to produce and to fall into. The big chunks of agriculture, working sectors, but now we're shifting. This group of students here, amazing group of students, we're talking about that top percent, 30, maybe 38 percent, somewhere there now, 36 percent now, where our jobs are shifting into that top tier. But our design of schools, schools like this, that is not the design of these schools were created with that in mind. It was a much more of an industrial type design for our schools. So this is a question that I throw out not only to parents, but to teachers as well. So the activity that I've, I've had with teachers is I've walked into a meeting and said, give me your social studies test. I was a social studies teacher. I'm going to take it into a staff meeting and I throw it to a group of parents or teachers. And it's likely that as a group we'll fail that test. It's likely that a group of successful adults would fail that test because a lot of times that's been rote memorization, remembering dates, things like that, as opposed to higher level things where students can walk away with um, a deeper knowledge, a deeper understanding. So this is the question I often ask. What if are the questions that you have on a, well, a worksheet, a test, if they can be answered on Google, are they good questions? Are they questions? And this has been a misperception in our school. So you see this right teacher up front, she's got an overhead projector, she's got an elbow document camera up front, some technology in the room, and here's a class from the early 1900s. But you're really you look at and think about these classes, because the state would be really changed that much. You have one person in front delivering information. So this is a challenge that I push one to one schools to say, we've got to be more than just about technology. We've got to be about changing the mindset of teaching and learning. So prepare our students with a different mindset. You use the example of the smart board. I'm actually sort of anti-smart board, anti-interactive whiteboard. Because I say it's not a game changer. I say a, a whiteboard is still one person up front manipulating information. It's the sage on the stage type model, as opposed to uh, one to one environment where it could be potentially a much more collaborative environment where everyone's researching, everyone's their hands on projects. A lot of technologies that we use we've simply changed the color of chalk in front of the room. Technology has, has really been unsuccessful historically. I, I looked at this and looked pretty extensively at it, and a lot of our technologies have been really poorly received. But up to this point, they've been teacher-centered technologies. And this is the shift. This is the shift to a student-centered technology initiative. And that is a big shift that we're making. So why do you need a teacher in Oxford? The, why do you need a teacher in a classroom? Right. It's it's edge. Edge. I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to follow you, and I, I think what you're saying is interesting and kind of edge, but if you're, if you're going to a game changer and you don't like the model, why are, why are we doing this in the classroom? Why aren't all the kids at home doing it online? I think the teacher role is more important than ever. And that role has shifted, though, to a coach, to a facilitator. So 
an amazing model that I saw a school in downtown Philadelphia, Science and Leadership Academy. Its demographics match that of downtown Philadelphia. This school, I walked in and I toured the school, and I had a hard time identifying in the classrooms where the teacher was. Often, it was at the side of the students. The students were really, really collaborative working, but they set up an environment that created and pushed students to work on their own, to work collaboratively. This school of under a thousand students has now developed a pact for the development of biodiesel fuels to be used that they let other countries use, underdeveloped countries use, as long as not to make money. I can't tell the location where it's being used, but they've developed this as a group, and they developed it collaboratively, collaboratively as students. I think the role is not only more difficult, I think it's challenging, it's a total shift in teaching. It's a hardship to move to that role where it's not just me up here delivering information, it's shifting, it's changing our pedagogy in a major way. A lot of our conversations in education have focused on reading, focused on math, focused on science. The conversation that hasn't happened nearly as much in education, like it has in other sectors, is how can technology impact schools and impact students. Some places have said it can be optional. In other words, technology should be optional. And, and I would push back on that. I said, what other profession can it be optional? I don't want a carpenter building my house who said I refuse to invest in technology. I won't use a nail gun, I won't use power saws. I refuse to invest in technology. I don't want a doctor who said 15 years ago I stopped investing in technology and the ways that I could use technology in my office. I don't want that. For some places it's been a game changer. Other places it's just increased efficiency, in other words, the way that we did work. But the tool has changed. David Warlick sort of reflected on just education in general. So what are some things that, that we can do? Insisting on a different kind of curriculum assessment, a different kind of instruction that we talk about that looks different, that looks different from what we traditionally have. This is the typical experience, educational experience for many students to walk in and they're super, super excited, and the five-year-olds, by the time they're 17, 18, they've lost a lot of that energy, a lot of that excitement in schools. When you look at technology, our students are using technology right now anyway. So the technology is there, our students are using it. They've used it to connect. They've used it to study and find things that they want to know about. They've used it to find interesting topics, and they're using technology in that way. A lot of times, the intensity that they've done it with is stopped at the school. Almost all of your students, your children, at some point are going to have some sort of e-learning, whether it be through a course, whether it be through a certification. Almost all of them at some point are going to have some type of e-learning. One to one, pure in every hand, has the potential to change. So it doesn't guarantee change. If that teaching model doesn't change, it doesn't guarantee change. The idea that Technology one to one needs to be ubiquitous. This is, again, I feel pretty strongly in the research and the schools that have lived in that environment for a couple different reasons. Oftentimes, if a device is everybody's, so a lab device, it becomes nobody's. There's not ownership in it, students still use it, they really fail to personalize it. At our student meeting, I found it was really interesting. That's what students kept echoing back to. They said, if we're going one to one, we want it to be personal devices that can become our own devices, essentially, that we can use as ours to study things that we want to study and learn about things that we want to learn about. This is a big shift we're talking about. This is a big change in our education. This is a challenge. It's a way more challenging than just putting a computer in everybody's hands. So I will, again, provide this. There's some fantastic books to sort of start thinking about some of these big shifts in education. Thank you. 
study recently of one-to-one -one initiatives throughout the world. These dots on the map, these aren't programs like ADS. These are regional programs. They only got a dot on the map if we're talking thousands or hundreds of thousands of devices. So um, I have a, actually a link, an interactive website. You can drag your cursor over any of these countries, you click on it, it tells you what device they are and how many devices there are. So you can see that it's, it's pretty widespread across the country. One of one programs aren't new. The oldest program, there's been a debate on this, are as old as 1986, Apple Classrooms of Tomorrow Project. And actually, interestingly, it wasn't a one to one, it was a two to one, because at that time, you're not lugging one of those computers home. So they actually had a, a desktop, students had one at home and had one at school as well. It was the first program, it was wildly successful, but I'll say this, it was one that they wanted to be wildly successful, they put resources behind it, training behind it as well to help it be very successful. International schools, this data was a year ago, fall of 2011. Uh, Kevin did some work on this. I think Dana looked on it as well. Um, these are schools that are sort of your family. The schools, as of a year ago, about 22 of those schools had some form of one to one, or about six that were not one to one schools. So I have on your tables a research brief, and it's a pretty easy read. And what it does, it looks at the research around one to one, what have been the impacts of one to one. And there certainly is positive impact. Now this is a sort of a key component to think about when you think about one-to-one. -one. Schools went one-to-one -one for different reasons. We should expect to see different results at different schools. So we've seen an increase in science, increase in math. One of the big, biggest ones academically has been in the area of writing, literacy, language arts. Those have been increased improvements. On the non-academic side, we've seen things like the, the biggest one would be increases in student engagement. That's one almost across the board, decreases in any occurrence of like discipline referrals and things like that. So those are sort of the, the research behind one to one, but I, I throw it out there and read it, but the one thing I have to echo is that this is really dependent on why your school goes one to one. If your school is gonna say, we're going one to one to be a science school, like we wanna be do, to excel at our science program, I would expect to see more improvements in that area. If you say we're going for writing, I would see, expect to see more shifts in that area. If you're doing it for 21st century skills, like you want your students creating more, you want them collaborating, connecting more, I would see it for those reasons. I would hope that that's the area that you see some <coughs> So as I said, academic achievement, literacy is another big one. Collaboration is why I get 21st century skills. This comes from the state of Maine, which went statewide one-to-one -one in 2003. So all the middle schools across the state of Maine. And these were students talking about their use of laptops. Laptops improve the quality of the work. 70% of students do more work when they use a laptop. I'm more likely to edit. So the school that I mentioned earlier was the Science Leadership Academy in Philadelphia. And this is what they established as their core values. <coughs> this is what the school was about. This wasn't about just a technology initiative, a technology school. And when you actually go to their school, they're really, um, they don't want to say they're, they don't want to talk about the tech. They want to talk about what they're doing in schools. So they have these five things, inquiry, research, collaboration, presentation, and research. And my push is that the things that those school, that school can do because of the technology is unimaginable without the technology. So if you look at the levels of research that they've done, they've created a patent on something, a biodiesel. That wouldn't be possible. It would be very, 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 very difficult without the technology. In other words, they use the technology not only for research, but to connect, connect with experts from around the world that can help them out, can help with their lessons. The presentation, the way that students presented, it was a game changer when technology was introduced and became of that environment. It became like oxygen. It was ubiquitous. It was everywhere. Was it always used? No, it wasn't always used. They made really good decisions about when should it be used in our times when it's not going to be used in the class. Considerations that we've had some fantastic questions about. Balance, safety, the use of technology. So this becomes very personal. This becomes very personal between a parent and a student. The school can provide resources. I think they have, and I think they will continue to provide resources. But some of this becomes really personal to you and your student. Asking questions like, what are our limits on using the technology? How often can you do it? Are there times when it's off limits? Is it navigatively 
I read recently someone compared this. They said this is an unfair bias for technology. Why don't we look at unhealthy balance in all areas? You know, what if a student is doing whatever it is, X, for lots and lots and lots of time? That can be concerned in any area. It's not unique to just technology. Safety, ask the questions like, where can your child use the device? Who can they communicate with online? Are they allowed to post things <coughs> online as well? So, where can you, again, these are really important questions when you think about having conversations and setting guidelines with your students. And this, I would say, is maybe the most important piece that's often left out of the conversation. What is the use of technology? People want to talk about screen time. I want to back up a step. There's a difference if you're playing mind-numbing, zombie-killing games for hours a day versus being involved in like some sort of educational activity. There's a major difference. So if we want to just throw out the term screen time, it's a major mistake. And not think about how we're using the technology. And this is a crucial piece. This ties to safety. This ties to balance as well. How are your students using that technology? What are they doing with it? So a comparison someone said is if you have pain, do you have art? They look at the lens of technology and screen time. Just because you have this technology, is it innately bad or is it innately good? It all comes down to how students are using it. Skills of the 21st century, we need them 
developmentally, is there a better age to introduce all this stuff? I mean, all of that piece I didn't hear, and I'm curious mm -hmm. if, if you have so, a so resource is, you can guide me to. That's a big area. Well, this has been a challenge that around one-to-one -one has been, as I mentioned at the end, schools have went one-to-one -one for a lot of different reasons. So to say, to say we're going to go one-to-one -one and expect X result in the learning has been a challenge because they implement it in different ways. So let me tell you the way that I'm pushing that schools need to implement is they need to implement and focus on more than just the technology, a change in teaching and learning is the way that I continually push schools to think about it. But that hasn't happened across the board. It certainly hasn't. There's been a lot of places that one-to-one -one have, they've given devices, lack of PD. There's places that have given um, devices and they've done things like, we're gonna do something like really focused, like a real math program or something like that. It seems successes in math. But a couple challenges here. So one is schools have went for lots and lots of different reasons. And the other issue, assessment-wise, education has not done a good job assessing the, a lot of these 21st century skills yet. So that is a work, sort of a work in progress is how do you address that? A piece of research also around, sort of you, you talked about the shift of, of teaching that happens in classrooms. Sometimes I get challenged and people say, but what about this like basic level of knowledge, right? This, this rote, sort of this information that we all, whether you want to call it your trivia knowledge or sort of that information level of knowledge, what research has shown is that when you're working at higher levels, so there's something called Bloom's Taxonomy, and it's a way that we process knowledge. So the highest level is create, and the lowest level is just like knowledge, like rote memorization. <coughs> but what research has identified is that when we learn at those higher levels, like we're creating things, we're synthesizing, we're evaluating, that's the best way to also learn that information at the lower level as well. But it is a shift in what's happening. I mean, it, it can be, but that's the that's what's sort of tricky about this. And it would be the same way as saying, like, I mean, if we use the word technology generally, right, we could have said, what was the impact of pencils on schools? And the, a more true conversation should be, how do you using that pencil? Right? Like if, I mean, that is what the impact is. Same with technology. How are you using the technology in school? And schools have used it lots and lots of different ways. Um, as an example, just one, just one second. If we can just raise our hands, and then I'll, then I'll select people, and I'll go up. Theo, and then I'm sorry, I don't know where everyone's saying, but I know Theo. One, two, three. Mm -hmm. Just to take, um, I don't know your name, but you're concerned a bit further. Um, I am also concerned about development, what our students are cognitively and physically capable of and what the technology demands of them. So, and also how exposure to technology changes the way our students perceive their own learning, which I think is wonderful. But for example, my fifth grader, who has always had major fine motor skills problems. In his writing, you know, to what was once publishing a piece would be to eventually have a really clean written piece of work out. Um, you know, all of his thinking process is editing and then he publishes it and it would be written out. So then he brings that home, this just happened, he brings that home, his perception of publishing now is it's got to be printed out with pictures on the computer, which is wonderful because, you know, so now technology has changed what his perception of publishing is. But who's got to type it out? I do. He can't type it out. Or he could, it would take hours and hours and hours. But he wants that outcome because he's been exposed to that outcome. So how does one, but he's not developmentally, he's just not physically capable of achieving that outcome. So what I'm seeing is that we're presented with all of these wonderful ways that we can now communicate and, and um, create, but I'm also seeing that you know children aren't quite capable of getting there yet. And how do we as a school and as, a, as parents support that? And, uh, and that's, that's such a burden, too, right. <laughs> as a parent. And I'm, I'm hearing that in the community that we suddenly, we are challenged as parents outside of the classroom in supporting our children. Mm -hmm. so, and should it be a choice? Should technology also be a choice? Um, not necessarily it has to be used. So, so the first one is maybe going to get into pro programmatically a little bit what's happening. Because I, I do think, from my conversations, I think there are some difference differences in the way that it's going to be rolled out throughout your different buildings. I can't address the specifics of that, but I believe there are some major differences between, for example, your um, elementary and versus your high school, the way that some of those things are happening. I think there are some big shifts that address parts of that. Um, 
I think beyond that, I think there are, I mean, I think there are some legitimate concerns that you have there as well about the production of work and questions about that. I can't answer specifics of exactly what teachers are doing. It's also a bit independent it's just that of... Is there, is there, but is there any research that shows... I mean, we understand that children develop cognitively and physically, and that what we challenge them with is appropriate to their ability. Mm -hmm. And that has to, I think, be reflected in the kind of technology that they are asked to use and access. Um, and and what, that, what, those, you know, what those borders are, you know, maybe this is just the way I think, but I sort of need to have those guidelines. We're given a continuum of what children need to learn at various grade levels and, and stages. That continuum for me is a really great visual. I'd love to know what that continuum is in terms of technology. Mm -hmm. I'd be cautious of that in terms of technology for a couple reasons. Mm -hmm. this, this environment that we're talking about is A, somewhat new. Even though it's existed, we could say, we could argue as long ago as 86 and some programs is 2000. In some ways, it's still a bit new, is a bit of a challenge. The other piece to this is also the way that different students develop differently. And I think that that's a major consideration. And I would look for your answers to questions like this at more practitioner and educational level, I think, to reflect sort of what's happening around that piece of it, just because of where we're at with technology and uh, an initiative such as this, which is different. I mean, it's a lot different than what we've historically done. And it's different than having, it's different than being in a technology-rich school, in other words, where there's lots of tech. It's different when something's ubiquitous. But I think that that comes down a bit more to a classroom educational level at the teacher. And I would say that that's a professional decision of the teacher and the parent more so than like something that I can come in here and say, here's an easy answer to this. Like if we look at, for example, you know, the kindergarten curriculum and like when it's appropriate to study uh, phonics and those, those sort of things. Um, we maybe have a solider base to, to put some of that in, but also even that is a bit dependent on students and they're, it's not so much age as it is like where they're at in that sort of cognitive stages and where they're at development wise. So I think that push, I push that back to a bit more of a classroom slash uh, even a professional educator, teacher, parent conversation. Uh, second question, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, I have a question and a comment. I'm yeah. a business owner and small business owner and employer. And I find a lot of the kids that are still coming out, even with some technology exposure, uh, they don't have research and collaboration skills. They still are thinking procedurally. And I need people who think conceptually and have those cognitive skills. So, I mean, we can say all that we want, but the businesses today, where your kids are going to be working after university, they need those skills. If they don't have it, uh, you had a slide there, they're just out of luck. Right, and I left the expletive off, off of there. But I have a question about that, uh, procedural teaching versus, uh, you know, and, and teaching our kids to think, mm -hmm. right? And uh, one thing I had read, that this is a segue from what you had mentioned earlier in your presentation, was that there are even universities that are teaching the core values that you just discussed, research, collaboration, reflection, I think of reflection as thinking, mm -hmm. that the professor actually his lecture or her lectures on YouTube, and the assignment is listen to the lecture, stop at this point, make your comments, go and do your fact checking. There's not one fact checker sit sitting in that classroom the next day. Every child there is a fact checker and they checked it the night before. This is a huge shift in the way they're teaching and I don't remember, uh, I'm 47 years old, I don't remember, but there are universities doing this now. That's a shift that's happening and what are you forcing then? And I remember from my own university days, Right? There's more time for that professor to actually teach them mm -hmm. and not profess yeah. uh, sage on the stage or yeah. what have you. And, uh, th and, and that's, yeah, that's all I have. So yeah. your first point, uh, there's a book, I, I think a fantastic read that talks about this conversation from a business perspective. It's the Global Achievement Gap. And Tony Wagner talks to lots of these CEOs across the world and I think what he, it was an interesting finding for me as an educator. Because from all the pushback we've had about things like literacy and reading like that, these business owners said exactly what you said. They said, we want, these are the things our kids aren't coming out with. They're not able to collaborate effectively. They're not able to think creatively. They're not able to question, like at high levels. Like all of these skills, um, and again, he calls them the seven survival skills. So it's a really interesting read and sort of maybe addresses some of the, what you described there as well. 
the other thing that you talked about is what we call flipped classrooms. And actually this is happening to a point here at your school. And this is an interesting model. So if you think about the traditional model of school, traditional model would be students come to my classroom and I give some sort of lecture, you know, 20 to 40 minutes, whatever it is. They go home, they solve their math problems, they say how awful their math teacher is because they're frustrated, they can't do it, they hit the roadblocks, they struggle, they get frustrated. Flip classroom turns that around. In the flip classroom, teachers <laughs> generally keep that shorter. It's not a 45 minute lecture. I think 20 minutes is about as long as a healthy length. Students receive that instruction at home. They actually come into the classroom and they do the opposite side of it. So they actually do the work in front of the teacher. The teacher can assess, they can see where they're at, they can help them, they can be over the shoulder, they can have the students collaborate together, and it makes more sense. It's a more efficient way of instruction in that they actually have that support, the expert, the person who taught them that, right there, and they're learning outside. The other advantage of this that I've seen in um, high school classrooms, and I experienced it myself, I have to say, in a statistics course, is that you have students that, when they listen to it, now their notes look a little bit different. They have notes, but they also say things like, 17 minutes in the note, he talked about omitted variable bias, or whatever the topic is. So you have students, as they're going through their work, now have this extra resource in their, in their earbud. Instead of just going to their notes, they go also to the YouTube video or the podcast or whatever it is. They go back and they say, let me watch the teacher work this out again, and I'm gonna come back to my work. It's been really valuable, but it's a, this is one of those big shifts. I mean, it's not an easy change. Right, I mean, what this is saying now is not children that have learned a memorized an algorithm, but what that teacher, I want the teacher here at AES telling my child, go home, uh, you learn the algorithm, and uh, or you've learned the algorithm, tell me how you can apply that algorithm to solve a real world problem tomorrow. Go pick a problem that you think you can solve with that even, mm -hmm. you know, thinking. Yeah. And that's, that's what the world needs, I think. And that's what our schools need to be doing. All right, uh, third question? Yeah, actually, several. <laughs> well, maybe just one. <laughs> yeah, they have to learn the fundamentals first before they can apply it. So then that still requires instruction and practice. And then the teacher goes in and shows them, look, here's a real world problem of all the things that you've learned, apply it to figure this out. But first you have to learn the fundamentals, how it all works, whether it's rote learning, the procedures, whatever. I mean, I've got a friend who is a PhD in physics. He's Jew genuinely a rocket scientist. He's been through about every math concept you can imagine, and he still maintains that's the best way, and that's what he does. His son recently got 600 out of 600 on a math competition. He was floored that his son actually got every answer right. He knew he would do well, but he couldn't believe that he got 600 out of 600. That's individual as well. I mean, it's not just who's teaching them. The thing that I wanted to say Again, you're talking about flipping it around. So the kids watch a video on YouTube and they stop at certain points and they do some research. And, and I they mentioned that's sort of a possibility no, I know. some people are doing. Absolutely, but how is that different than a teacher giving them a document the class, class period before and saying at this point, this point, and this point, I want you to go and fact check and then report back to me in class. How is that different? Why does, I mean, I understand that you're having someone talk and it's a video and it's great. And other than saving the paper, you're really doing the same thing. But my real question to you is, so if technology makes effective oral and written communication skills, tell me what, what that looks like. Because you still have to know how to speak. You still have to know how to write, whether it's physically write with your hand or type. But you still, it's, last time I checked, speaking was not still the technology of my vocal cords. So, so how do you teach someone that with technology? So. I don't think that anybody here is arguing that you're going to stop having students speak or talk to one another. No, I am not saying that. I'm saying, how does that, I want to know how that looks like. I mean, what do you, how do you use technology to make someone a better oral pre presenter? I don't know if that would be my charge with the technology would make someone a better oral but that presenter. Was, that was a little blurb off your, your presentation. That's why I picked up on that one. I thought, wow, that's a great example. How does technology, what does that look like? So, so the side that I, the spin that I think a lot of like schools, like for example, would be they look at the presentation aspect of it. And that's just one component is the technology. But there's still all of the regular, your sometimes described as soft skills, those things. Those aren't disappearing in any way. But our, right. our tools, 
that students have that are able to present with, they change when technology is a piece of this. A fantastic book, if any of you are into that, do lots of presentations, this presentation is Zen. Fantastic book about the art of presentations. And one piece of it is the technology and the way that it's delivered. But let's face it, a big chunk of that is also the, the message, the way that it's created. Now, if I was in a classroom, is, are there ways that technology could help me in that? Certainly. So, I'd use, tell me what it looks so like. for example, potentially, could have students visit with someone that's really highly skilled in that, but I would increase like collaboration. So how do you have students work into someone that's a different audience than just their teacher or just the students in the classroom? How do you open up their audience? Because there's a difference in presenting to your teachers, your students in your class and your teacher than it is to present to someone else somewhere else. It's a, it's a bit of a shift. A little spin from just the oral communication. On the written side, with technology, how people have empowered that, and it's from the idea of let's develop a wider audience. So typically our audience as students has been a couple places. It's been either parents or teachers. And let's just face it, we're not a very good audience for a lot of kids. In other words, you know, that's not the kid's most <laughs> the greatest place to publish to a parent and to a teacher, right. right? But when in some places where they've expanded that audience, whether it be through a blog, and it might be just expanding it to maybe the extended family, or an author, as I commented on the school of Mumbai, an author that wrote the book becomes their audience, that's pretty cool. Or a, and another example of a young student who had a physicist comment on their work the student wrote about, I forget what the topic was, but wrote out, and it was actually like a world-renowned physicist. I don't know how he found the blog, but actually made a comment on it. And expanding that audience is pretty powerful. Now, I've stepped a bit away from oral into the written side of it. Um, but I, I think I want to make clear that this is not all technology all the time. And maybe that, maybe that message came across, and it shouldn't have. And I think that that's not where we want to go. I think we have to ask the question, how are we using technologies, and how can it empower students? So yesterday, working with your, um, your administration, I talked about, there's something called Bernadine Porter. She has a technology and learning spectrum. And she looks at ways that we use technology. Kaleidos classifies it, it's pretty simple, into three categories. Category one is literacy uses. So that means you're coming to my class and I'm teaching you how to use Excel, or I'm teaching you how to use Word. I'm, I'm teaching the tech. The middle category, she talks about adapting technologies. So that would be my comparison of we're changing the color of chalk in the front of the room. I a lot of times say an interactive whiteboard is just adapting technology. We're not really game changing. We're not really changing education. And the third category she talks about is transforming. So that means now I have, again, my students, something I couldn't do before. So my students collaborating with a class halfway across the globe where they essentially are a virtual class together. My kids are taught by a teacher in another place. I still have a teacher in my classroom, but have that access. And that's the transforming uses. Historically, what, where we fall are heavy literacy, heavy adapting, very small transforming. So my challenge is to think about, as a school, how do you shift more to that transforming uses? How do you look for those empowering uses of technology in a transformative way and, and make a bit of a shift into that environment? So thinking about the ways that technology are used, and I said this word is important, but usage is, is really what it's going to come down to. So, oh, wait, can I, can I just yeah. try this case? Ooh, ooh Mr. Carter. <laughs> okay. I'm going to come at it from a perspective of employability. Okay. okay. Talking is just talking, whilst it's really important and use it vocal, is no longer enough in the office. It's just not, because we don't talk. It, the one-on-one -on -one conversations face-to-face -face in today's working world are a thing of the past. We need to do you know, podcasts and webinars. We need to be talking and have meetings with people in 300 different countries on occasion. Right. And you can't do that with that technology. So digital natives, our kids, as they grow up in this world, we need, certainly they need to know how to talk and write, but they also need to know how to loop in you know, real-time information, they, they, there's concepts like big data, there's so much stuff out there that's happening in communication. Communication has, technology has fundamentally changed both the creation and the consumption of communication. And if we don't start to teach our kids that now, our kids are not going to get the jobs of the 21st or even, you know, the late 20th century. <laughs> that's I'm going to hold on to you in school. Second. So I was just going to say, yeah, we're, I'm talking about learning. Yes. We're not talking about how it's used in business. So, I want to know how you so learn to be better so oral, child, oral speaker. So for instance, I would need my child, to, my children, I have two, mm -hmm. to know how to speak and how to communicate to an audience in a room, but also an audience half a world away, and to be able to communicate with visuals and sounds and words and not just voice. Because voice alone, 
Um, just listening to the radio is nowhere near as engaging as watching a multimedia presentation. Right. So I need my kids to learn how to use that. But it's I find it, I'm going to move on Literacy to another question. Wait, 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 just one moment. Thinking. Isn't it still about I'm going to move on. Have I got other people read. with their hands up. Okay. So we're going to try and give everybody an equal chance to ask a question. Need. They need foundation. Yes. Okay. Next question. I, I'm going to. I need to take this conversation a slightly different way, but I. Um, but I do want to say that this is a very tech savvy community. You saw all of our iPads, and I. I don't think anyone here says no to tech. I mean, in fact, I think most of. I'm sitting here thinking, yeah, my my kids are eight and ten. I feel like they're already extremely savvy, mm -hmm. and that makes me sensitive to issues of tech for tech sake. They're already getting tech for tech sake. They're all, already learning at home and on their own how to do the cool stuff. So I'm concerned that the stuff that happens in school is because they will learn deeper or better be using tech, not tech for tech's sake. I think that's happening with or without us in this generation. So, but what I want to, this, this loops in a little bit. The, all this access, I mean, what I think what's going on a lot right now is that many of our kids all of a sudden have a huge jump in access to screen time, to the internet. Um, you, you call it, um, anywhere, anytime learning. I think many of us also feel it's anywhere, anytime, everything else. You know, they've got five tabs open. Um, what I'm curious about and interested in is to what degree can we expect kids to supervise themselves? I mean, when we talk about readiness, you know, we look at times when they're ready to be potty trained, when they're ready to learn to read. When is it fair to say to 13-year-olds, um, I thought you were you know, you only had 20 minutes of Facebook time, what are you doing now? Especially when half of us have trouble getting off the technology. <laughs> How can we help them? Is it fair to ask them to supervise themselves? Two things. So the first one, tech for tech's sake. I, I don't, again, I don't think anyone's pushing for that. I think that to go a step further than that, actually the opposite would be true. Like, for example, the conversation that, that I mentioned previously about how is tech being used, right? So yeah. as a school, we need to look at is it adapting, is it literacy, is it transformative uses of technology? So I think a spectrum like that actually highlights the opposite and says, let's not just throw tech out there and just use tech because that's a mistake yeah. if we're just going to use it and not be really thoughtful about how we're doing it. And the second, and my answer to your question is no. I don't think we can expect students to do that without some like serious coaching yeah. and conversation. We can't throw them into that world about how they do that. Now, and I think I that's where know, we are now. Yeah, and I don't. I don't think anyone's fighting the world. I think it's like, oh God, help us Imagine. navigate and, yeah. and help our. What should we be doing? How can yeah. we? How can we? How can we make sure our kids aren't exposed to stuff they're not ready for? How can we make sure they're not wasting a ton of time when they could be also learning an instrument and also, um, you know, we kind of need some guidelines and some help. All of a sudden, they have a bag of candy at home. And they want to eat that. I mean, it's very, you know, it's very appealing for all of us. We all have these things at home. Um, and now they can say, but I'm doing homework. Um, so it's kind of, it's kind of school sanctioned. Whereas it's like, well, yeah, I can see you're doing homework, but you're also, you got these other things up here. Um, that, does that really require us to look over our middle schoolers? I mean, that's not, this is usually an age when they get more independence. Mm -hmm. And it's coming at a time when it almost seems like they need more supervision. Yeah, that's how yeah. I'm feeling yeah. as well. Yeah. I, I, think it, I think that that becomes personal to your student, right? And what your students are doing and, and where they're, in other words, like if your students is successfully accomplishing, it, again, let's say you identify 40 minutes that he's doing whatever, technology, yeah. and every indicator is that he's successfully completing what he needs to be completing. I mean, I think those would be indicators no different than, you know, the conversations we had, you know, 10 years ago where, uh, a student was in his room doing homework, the TV was also on, or whatever he was doing also around it. What are indicators that it's not being successful? Homework's not getting done, there's feedback from teacher that something's not happening, some of those indicators. I, I think that that is a bit more of a parenting, like your decision for your own personal life. What does it look like for my student? Because middle school, as a middle school person, maturity level of your students is, is like this, yeah. right? I mean, across the board. now. Are there general indicators, guidelines, things like have the computer in a place that we can see yeah, it? We do all, we it. Yeah, we do. We all do that. Like that is like like things like that are general <laughs> things. Like yeah, we all have even, even more <laughs> like basic things. Is there something like I mean, again, when it becomes a real problem, like anything, we need to put more guidelines in place. Like is even if it gets as sim simplistic as you know what, we're going to have a timer that we're going to say this is the time that you have on 
X technology because you've shown that you can't do it in a, in a I don't want to say respectful, but in a responsible yeah. way. And so we've added these guidelines to students. And also, again, a bit dependent on their age, if they're mm -hmm. a high schooler versus a, a middle schooler. But we, we have to teach our students this. Yeah. Like, we have to have them, they have to develop these skills. And do we want to develop these skills with us at home, or do we want to develop them when, they're, when they leave home, when they're on their own, outside of school? And I think that that's, uh, I would argue that we need to teach them responsible use of a device. What yeah. does it look like? I mean, how do you sanction time? Yeah. This whole idea of multitasking. Um, multitasking, if anyone that's a cognitive scientist would say, is not possible. Anyone that's a parent would argue with me about that. But there's something that students do. It's simultaneous tasking, basically. So in other words, they're really quickly switching from one task to another. It's not yeah. true multitasking. But they're moving really quickly from one thing to another. But having conversation, educating about when it's appropriate to do that and when it's not. Because there is some research on the fact that when we want like heavy cognitive loads, so in other words, when we want kids doing highly advanced things, it's not very good to be moving in these, yeah. these yeah, yeah. shifting worlds. Like the education piece on that. Now, I can't speak to all what is happening with yeah. that, like, but I can say that <coughs> that goes every education, that conversations in the classroom. Um, I, again, I'm not sure what's happening in that. I'm not sure where some of the, your programmatic stuff has happened, so I can't speak to specifics about some of that. I'm going to take one last question. I apologize. I know there are more hands up and more questions when we have time, but I do have to get in somewhere at 1030, and you've had your hand up. Um, really so I'm, I'm very much glad where she is. I think it's a wonderful opportunity. I think the parents' concern come from that the challenges it brings uh, to us, and also to it, we are not used to. So because, I mean, we, have, we, we didn't have to fight in our times, you know, these challenges, uh, our parents didn't have to fight these fights, so we, we don't know how to react to some of the things. So I think we, are, and because they, uh, of their age, especially in middle school, but even more in elementary, we are very involved in this. Mm -hmm. However, we feel a bit lost of how mm -hmm. to handle some of the things. So I think <coughs> we need this help in, you know, um, presenters or, or maybe literature, how we can handle screen time or somebody there is a posture. And also, I think curriculum wise, and, and, and most probably the school is already working on this, you know, because it brings challenges to teachers too, in terms of if they will use this more, let's say, at some point they have to teach kids how to type. Even maybe it's not in your yeah. hearing, but you know, it's just offer something, or teach them how to use, you know, internet responsibly. Uh, so I think it, it, it uh, gives challenges to the schools, yeah. because the kids will need extra skills they didn't need before. Until you don't have the laptop, you don't need to know. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's, then it's not school responsible. Now suddenly they use it, so of course now it, it rests also on the school how to, how to teach them. <coughs> and also us as parents, so we get help, so we can help the kids, yeah. and it can be a good, core, you know, because it has to, I mean, it's, and, and that this is what we try here. Yeah, it's, it's a collaboration between the school and the parents and the kids. Otherwise, it's, it cannot work, so we all, yeah. And I don't know how much knowledge is out there on this, but it would really appreciate if uh, if you could get that knowledge. So when I got here, I have to say I was a bit impressed. I found mm -hmm. Dana's book on her shelf that she actually prepared for all middle school students. Now, I don't know what's happened at the other two levels, but included in that book are stuff from like Common Sense Media, which is a mm -hmm. resource that we maybe have explored already. I, I love in that there's actually like a contract in it, which I love. I think it's fantastic. Um, in other words, it's a contract that looks at different issues of usage, the way that it's being used. I think it's a it's a pretty good start to that conversation. I think it's a pretty good guide. Now, um, I don't know, I don't know if that's going to be reproduced, or I think she's actually in the process of how it's going to be reproduced, um, like at the high school. But a lot of those components, I think, are really strong ones. Now, maybe I don't know. Did everyone get one of those books? Yeah. So okay. now I have to say though, maybe maybe an approach might be. I mean, I don't know that everyone went through the book like entirely. Possibly, we'll say that happened. So I wonder if we can be deliberate in that we maybe specifically send like that piece out, like that just that one piece, maybe and maybe the same thing at the elementary and high school that gets that. Essentially, there's a part in there that's almost like a contract that gets at some of that. I, I think that that would be an easy thing to to communicate with some just piece of literature like that that we could get out, and that might be helpful for for parents. Barbara, I have a helpful suggestion. There's a beautiful course in eighth grade that kids do called Health, yeah. which teaches them about anorexia, bulimia, 
you know, um, drugs, cigarettes, maybe we can add to that unit uh, something that makes kids aware about the issues of just getting distracted, the internet usage, you know, when you're doing homework, concentrate, there is an advantage to that. Maybe there is a there is a forum from school in which the kids can be taught the advantages of concentrated learning versus distractions and the kind of distractions that are that are out there and the disadvantages of that. So through your health course. Well, there's a, there's a exploratories as well. The exploratories to teach them how to type. It could teach them how to manage their time. It could teach them stu study study skills. So I I like this idea and I've actually pushed it at other middle schools and a lot of times focusing on positive digital footprint, but expanding that topic, like responsible use around tech, and I think it's a fantastic idea. Um, I can even push for it to be its own course. The other thing that I would push for, and I always do, a challenge is that, a worry that I always have, is we can't let it live in that one place. It like, has to be present in every course, right? It has to be present that we're teaching, like, as a, if we have a science test, let's talk about what it looks like to, to study for this. And tech's a part of that conversation, there are a lot of other pieces about su successful study skills, and that's a worry sometimes, like, I think tech is lived alone, like in a place, but let's talk about how is it integrated in oral communication, how is it integrated in piece X, Y, and Z, but I think that's a, a fantastic idea to have something explicitly addressing that topic. You know, I, I'm sorry that we don't have more time for this. I think you guys have a lot of questions and you've raised some great issues. Barbara, could back? Are you free? Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> 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 but before, before you guys negotiate that with Barb, I just want to say thank you um, for coming. Thank you for your questions. And, I mean, please know that's one of the – because of everything that we're doing here at the school around technology, that's why – we saw Nick as such a, a fabulous opportunity for our school to come in and, and live with us, you know, and, and really work with us for three weeks. So I hope that you've gotten some things out of today, and I'm sure I know the conversations uh, will continue probably in the school and outside of school. And so but thank you very much. I'm going to shuttle him off to his next. Thank you. Thank you.